what happens over the course of the next 45 minutes will determine whether the last four years of oh, preparation geez. were a waste of time or not. And suddenly in your mind, because you're focused on failure, there's an emotional escalation. Welcome to this next episode of Beyond Victory. Thank you very much for tuning in. And today I'm very excited because up to now it's really been me sort of even positioned a little bit as an interviewer. Yeah, and I'm not quite yet happy with that role yet because I want to be able to add more value to the podcast. So today I've got Matthew Syed with me and I'm looking forward to for the first time properly engaging <laughs> in this topic and this topic which we're going to attack today. I'm going to be moving away from, or we're going to be moving away from sort of business, where I've been recently with my podcast, and more towards really high mental p performance, mm -hmm. yeah, and extracting the best out of yourself mentally. And this is something that's really close to my heart, and I've looked forward to doing an episode like this, more this, this direction. Um, and I'll do a quick intro if it's okay. So, Matthew, um, you were one of, well, the best British ping pong players. Back in your you know, day, I, I don't mind it being called ping pong, but you know about table tennis. No, about, <laughs> but we, it's weird, Nico. About about twenty five, thirty years ago, if people sorry said, about no, that. no, that's all right. But people used to say ping pong, and I'd be like, but how? How you can't call it ping pong? Because that sounds like some kind of ridiculous sport that people play in their basement. But now, ping pong has become a fashionable uh, term, so I don't mind it. Keep going, keep going. Very good. So it didn't take <laughs> me long to go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so the best British table tennis player. And then you went to the Olympics and you had one of your um, really life-defining moments. Yeah, that's true. Um, Olympic Games in, in Barcelona in 92. It, it was a good Olympics. I lost to the world number one, but it was a tight match. The second Olympics in Sydney, you know, every four years. It's a long cycle. Most important thing in the calendar. And a long build-up, preparation. Everything was perfect, to be honest. And I thought there was a realistic chance of winning a medal. And then I walked out to play a German opponent, a guy called Peter Franz. I can't say that name without recoiling in, in horror because I choked, got nervous, wasn't able to do the thing I'd spent a lifetime preparing for. But in a funny kind of a way, that got me very interested in the mental side of performance. I know we're going to get onto that. Yeah, so this, uh, this then, as you just said, I gave you this huge motivation to try and learn about it and understand what just happened to you. Yeah. And today, you are a best-selling author uh, on these kind of topics. You've written Bounce and Black Box Thinking and have had huge success in trying to give advice to people on these matters of how to cope under these extreme stress situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you're about to take your job interview, the one you always wanted to have, yeah and have looked forward to for three years, or you're about to take that last exam at university. We've all been through that, and we all know how horrible those situations are. Um, so this is your real expertise, and therefore really looking forward to that. And not only that, but marg marginal gains. Mm -hmm. So every little bit counts to get to the best perfor performance. That's gonna be another cool topic. So these are really the main two topics to look forward to. Um, and then maybe then going back to that moment in ping pong, Yes. Sorry, table tennis. That's okay, that's Let's okay. change it. Ping pong. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can deal pong. with it. <laughs> in German, it's ping pong. So, yeah, anyways, yeah. Um, no, okay. Isn't it teach tennis? In, in teach tennis. Yeah, but we more use ping pong somehow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's more the casual friendly right, way. Right, right. So there we go. So I'm going to stick with that today. Okay. Huh. Let's go back to that moment then. Um, Olympics, Sydney, right? Yeah. Yeah. First round, you're on for the medal. Two minutes before you're going, going on the pitch, you find out you're on BBC One. Yes. The whole of the UK is watching, your family is watching. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you hit that first ball and you notice, damn, I can't play the way I used to. I'm just under too much pressure. That, that's almost exactly how it was. But there was something else too. Just before I went out, my coach said to me, and he was trying to motivate me, but you can imagine the effect it had. He said, Matthew, what happens over the course of the next 45 minutes will determine whether the last four years of oh, preparation geez. were a waste of time or not. That's not And he good. was trying to make me think this is really the crux moment. But when I look back on it, you know, I mentioned in your intro, sorry for interrupting, but the, the preparation had been very good. We went to the Gold Coast before the competition proper, 
and I had sparring partners who had a similar style to the person I was meeting in that first match, both left-handers, one from Denmark, one from the UK. We trained in a hall with the same flooring, the same level of lighting, the same lux as I'd get in the competition venue. So everything had been configured in such a way as to give me the best chance to perform. But it's on BBC One. I'm thinking of my parents watching at home. I'm thinking of my first coach watching. And I'm thinking of all of the sacrifice I've put in for this big moment. And the first shot was played by this German, or the second shot. And I struck the ball, I sliced, and it missed the table by about two feet, three feet. It wasn't a marginal miss, it was an absolutely dramatic one. And I could feel this metamorphosis happening in my body and mind. And I completely mellowed down. You know, back in those days, games of table tennis were up to 21 points. And a normal game would be like 21-19, 21-18, 22-20. We were ranked at a similar level in the world. I lost one of the first two games 21-2. <laughs> this is not possible. It's not conceivable. And I could see Peter looking at me with pity. And this is meant to be a competitive match. And I lost. I was, I was out in you know, 30 minutes of the Olympic Games. And as you say, it made me try and understand what was going on. And that's a big part of bounce, which you, which you kindly mentioned. And I mean, I'll go into what I think was happening at a psychological level, even at a neurophysiological level in the second. But let me just throw one back at you. Because you said, I think rightly, that sports people have these crux moments in their lives. But it's true of anybody. You have to give a speech at a wedding. That's pressure. Same. You do a job interview, pressure. We all know those curious feelings that you get when you're about to perform. Did you experience that kind of stuff in F1? Did you feel your body restricting, your breathing becoming different, your heart rate changing? And how did you cope with it? Um, of course I had it. We all have it. Every single person in this world has it. And for me, a lot of it was uh, fear of failure. Yeah. That was the biggest one. Because I had lost to Lewis uh, the two years before. Mm. And I knew how damn horribly painful that was. Of course, it's always subjective because there's completely other pain out there in the world, I know. Yep. But in that moment, it just seems like the biggest thing in the world for you personally because I've dedicated my life to it every single day just for that. And so fear of failure was, uh, was huge. And that was the biggest contributor to me feeling so damn stressed in that moment. Joe, it's funny you should say that because when I did some analysis on it and looked in, uh, at what the evidence was saying, that's what happens. People think to themselves, what if I lose? And of course, in my mind, about to go on to play, I think, well, if I lose, I might lose my funding because my funding is dependent <laughs> on performing. And then I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, if I lose my funding, then I might not be able to afford my mortgage repayments on the flat I'm living in. If I can't afford my mortgage, I'm going to have to move out of my flat. And if I move out of my flat, then my girlfriend's going to leave me. And if my girlfriend leaves me, you know, that means that my parents aren't going to get the grandchildren they wanted. Oh, my goodness. And suddenly in your mind, because you're focused on failure, there's an emotional escalation. Negative and, spiral, I call it. And exactly that, a negative spiral. And in fact, you can, you can see this in, the, in a brain scanner, a small piece of the brain called the amygdala. It's a very ancient part of the brain. We share it with reptiles and other creatures. So it came about very early in evolution. It lights up when we are confronted by danger. Now in our evolutionary past, that would be the danger of a predator. And then when it lights up, you get into the fight, flight, fight, flight. Are we cutting that or do we let no, it run? No, this is good, this is good. <laughs> What's the other one? Fight, flight. Should we check in your books? <laughs> anyway, long there's time another ago. one. There's, long a, long there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fight, flight, something else response. And it makes sense when you're confronted by a predator, right? You want to run away as fast as possible. Um, you want, if the predator corners you, you will fight that predator in order to save your life. Um, but when you're about to do something complex, like play a ping pong game, a table tennis match, you don't want to run out of there, do you? You, you feel Sometimes the you do. <laughs> yeah, you do, you do when you're playing against Peter Franz. Um, but you want to be able to do something complex and subtle and creative. And when you're in that kind of psychological state, it's very difficult to do that. And I think that's what happened to me. And I think a lot of it is, a lot of managing pressure is dealing with what you described as a negative spiral in an effective way. By the so, way, sorry, the other one is freeze. Fight, flight, freeze. 
So, so if a predator comes into the room, you freeze, it's more difficult for them to detect you. So often when you're about to, I don't know, say you're facing a bowler at cricket, you see people literally become highly static because that's the fight, flight, freeze response. Or they're saying, I need to get out of here, I want to run away, which is how we often feel when we, you know. But in the modern world, our threat is a threat to ego, isn't it? It's the threat to ego of losing to Lewis. It's the threat to ego of messing up against Peter Franz. It's the threat to ego of standing in front of a group of people and not delivering a great speech. But when the threat is of that kind, it's the worst thing in the world to freeze, to fly, or to fight. You want to be able to think in a creative way. You need to bring that adrenaline, the arousal level down. If I maybe I elaborate a little bit on that, ego goes all the way to our need of recognition. Yeah, from all the people around us, which is very, very powerful. It's like instinctive in us human beings, isn't it? And that is very, I mean, linked to ego, which you were talking about, that we're in so much need of recognition yeah. Um, yeah. from other people. And that's also which leads to this fear of failure. But I if think you fail, no recognition. That's true. But I, you know, so I think it can be a, a, a really galvanizing force. So, so for example, you know, when you're building up to an F1 race or I'm building up to the competition, a, one way to motivate me is to say, you know what? I'll get recognition. I don't think there's anything necessarily unhealthy about that. I think we are social animals, aren't we? And we kind of have some understanding of where we stand amongst our rivals, our competitors, our friends, and so on. I think that can be healthy. I wouldn't want to say, but I think in the moment that you perform, if you're too paranoid about that, it can shut down your level of creativity, your judgment, your decision making. I think that's where it can be dangerous. Um, maybe let's dive into then how to solve this issue. And I think start with your one, because I think you've nailed it better than I have in my time. <laughs> so, so I'm happy to start. I definitely <laughs> don't think I've nailed it better than you, because I mean, <laughs> as, a, as a world champion, you were at a m much higher level in your sport than I was in mine, believe okay. me. Yeah. But I'll tell you what I did, and this will sound to, to your listeners ridiculous. But think of the negative spiral. You know, what if I lose? I'll lose my job, you know, I'll lose my reputation, people won't admire me as much. That's but I think you need to cut that spiral off by saying, you know, even if I lose, I will still have something I can hold on to. Now this will sound really ridiculous, but what I used to say before I went out to play in matches after two thousand and today when I give speeches or I'm in a pressurized situation, I say to myself, you know what, win or lose, my parents will still love me. <laughs> Now, weirdly, my parents think this is quite an optimistic uh, claim. But can you see how that gives you the reassurance that it, even if I lose, my parents will still love me? And I use that as my like foundation, and I build back up from there. And at the Olympic Games in 2012, it was a British staged Olympics in London. A lot of the athletes working with psychologists had a form of trigger words that just gave them that reassurance. So they weren't worried about the catastrophe. They felt that they had some ground level reassurance that would give them what they needed to deliver. Okay. Can you relate to that at all? Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to include uh, some new thing this time in my podcast, which is the beyond victory moment. Go on. Which is where I need to highlight something that's been said. Yep. Yeah, and so I'm going to say it this time now. So the way you're saying it is in your head, repeat to yourself, what will happen in the worst case scenario and pick out the positives right. of that worst case scenario, yeah. which is the love from your parents exactly. or, or any other positives, the love from your girlfriend yes. or other positives that you may have, your best friends, and repeat those positives to yourself over and over. Yeah. And that will um, give you a, a, stronger, a strong foundation so you have less fear yeah. of failing because you know that the worst case, you're going to fall back down to this positive foundation. That's exactly it. I mean, that, that, that encapsulates it a lot better than I did. So let's, yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> well, why didn't you tell me that like before, yeah, no, before 2016? Yeah. It would have been so much easier. <laughs> I, Which I, year did you win the world championship? 2016. Yeah. Oh. yeah. It would have been so much easier. But, you, you, but go on, but you must have had some techniques. Almost every sportsman I've interviewed, that they will have a pre-match or a pre-race or a pre-meet routine. Did you have one? Yeah, yeah, I did everything. Uh, meditation, repetition, I did all of that stuff. Right. Yeah, flat out as much as I could, but I didn't have this uh, key ingredient that I repeated to myself that I worked, uh, I, I didn't manage to figure that out. A little bit I did have, 
in that I repeated to myself that failure is not a bad thing, yeah, which right. is also something, a separate topic, which you actually touch on a lot, yes. for kids especially, I think. Yeah, so important. Um, that it, to under, try and repeat to yourself and start understanding that failure is actually, in the long run, your greatest gift. Yes. Because in failure, you progress as a human being, you yeah. learn, yeah. you grow, yeah. and growth brings happiness. In, in, the, in the end. And as it, you know, funnily you should say that because I think that that is also a part of how we get better in terms of our psychological performance. We need to see those occasions where we do fall apart as learning opportunities to come up with new techniques, new strategies to help us. I'll give you an example. There's two, two sports people, Rory McIlroy, golfer, Jimmy White. He's a snooker player. Now, Jimmy White had a big problem with his mental game. Very talented player, left-hander, brilliant potter of the ball. He got to six World Championship finals, lost all of them. No! In one of them, That's it's, painful. It's a, it's pa- I tell you, this was pain. That's it was so painful. It's up to 18. In one of them, he led Stephen Hendry, who was then the world mm. number one, 14-8, and lost 18-14. On another one, it was 17 all, and he had a black off the spot, so a pretty easy shot to make. And then he would have been, I think, two pots away from the title, and he twitched. You know what I mean? He, oh. he lost his technique. Oh. Now, Ma- Rory McIlroy, um, you remember when he was in contention to win his first major? It was the US Masters uh, a few years ago, and he was on the back nine, and this was his first opportunity to win one of the biggest four competitions in golf, probably the most prestigious event in his sport. And he drove off the tee, and he went miles to the left. He had a complete meltdown. I think he had a double bogey, triple bogey, double bogey, went way down the field. Now, what interests me about that is you look at the response of these two sports people to what happened. I interviewed Jimmy White, and he said, you know what? I'm just not very good mentally. It's one of those things. There's nothing I can do about it. Sometimes it happens for you. Sometimes it doesn't. I thought, that's interesting. No wonder he didn't improve his mental game because he didn't see his failures as an opportunity to improve his mental game. Rory McIlroy, on the other hand, after he fell apart at the Masters in Augusta, he went home and he watched a video of what had happened. He wanted to learn the lessons. And he noticed that between shots, what he would normally do is wind down a little bit, talk to his caddy, switch off, and then go to his next shot and switch back on. But he was just totally... um, focused just on his golf. He wasn't talking to anyone, he wasn't winding down, and he was becoming more and more anxious about the way he played. So he said, okay, at the next tournament, the next major, I'm gonna give myself a strategy of between shots, talking to my caddy about what we watched on telly last night, what Manchester United did at the weekend, and then 20 seconds before he addressed the ball, he would flick back on to the golfing head, and he thought this could help me. He won the next major by some record number of shots. And don't you think that's interesting? That when you see the mental side of performance as something you have control over, something you can improve, it gives you the incentive to create the array of behaviors that enables you to deliver under pressure. So I think you're absolutely right about the importance of failure, but I think it applies to everything in our lives, including our mental games. Um, no, I agree. Just I want to add, I wanna add that it's not a... It's not a quick solution there. Right? That's right. <laughs> it takes, it's a journey, right? It takes a hell of a lot right. of effort. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't to make a, a transition like that. Right. So if you're listening, please don't think it's a one-day right. quick fix. <laughs> I think and I, s- I speak of experience. Yeah, right. It took me a long, long time. Yeah. And I made you know it's small steps. It's yeah. marginal gains it is. in your it words. Is. Right? It is. Even it's there. Exactly that. And yeah. I think that's a problem. If people think that they can become mentally adept in one day or become a great violinist in one day, then they're going to be disappointed. They're going to see, oh, gosh. I think you've got to see it as a journey. Almost everything in life is a journey. Now comes my next beyond victory moment. The journey itself and the effort you put into that journey brings more happiness and well-being to your life because you progress, personal development, yeah? Whether you go to the gym, you come out of the gym, you're happy because you've made personal progress and developed yourself. Mm. And if you embark on this journey of making mental progress as well, it's, it's the journey itself which already has a huge impact yeah. because you know that you're working on yourself. It gives you this better feeling of self-worth, yes. confidence, and happiness. So even that alone is worth a lot. 
It is worth a lot. There's uh, there's a lot of literature on this too. I mean, Robert Louis Stevenson, great American novelist, said it's better to travel hopefully than to arrive. <laughs> the the journey yeah. is what really you know. I've interviewed a few sports people who assume that the who who have I think wrongly assumed that the destination is what matters the most, and then they win something. I don't know if you experienced this, and then they're like, they've nurtured this ambition for so long. And they think that they're gonna win the Olympic gold medal and that's gonna give them every kind of happiness they're ever gonna want for the whole of the rest of their lives. And they realize it, isn't, it doesn't work like that. And there can be quite a profound sense of anti-climax. Um, I interviewed Thomas Bjorn, the European Ryder Cup captain last week. And after his first European PGA Tour title victory in 96, he said he went back to the dressing room, he did the prize ceremony, did the interviews, went into the corridor, everyone had left, and he was like, is that it? <laughs> is that it? You know, what I thought, and I think it's a bit like you've nurtured this ambition for so long that it becomes part of who you are, and then suddenly you've got it, and it feels like a bereavement almost. And I think you're right, that it's it's the journey that is such a powerful, life-affirming, satisfying thing it's not to say that the destination doesn't matter i think it can give you a feeling of vindication but if you think that that is going to make you happy now and forever people who think that they're going to work hard and buy themselves a porsche and that's going to give me everything i need i don't think life works like that and i don't think psychology works like that either well i, I think for a fact life does not work right. like that uh, um, go on tell me so after uh, formula one 2016 happy for sure yeah but it doesn't, it doesn't take you through the rest of your life going, yeah, wow, I'm a world champion. It's nowhere near enough, is it? There's other things that... Of course, yeah, yeah of course. Um, it's not like now I'm a much, much happier person than I right. was before. But it has given me a certain power because of the mm. way it happened. It was just so perfect for me. And, yeah. and I managed to, in my mind, see it as a fulfillment. Yes. Yeah. And that I didn't, I don't need another two, three, four championships. So yeah, I, did, right. I did manage to frame it in my mind that way yeah. with repetition. Yeah. yeah, and it was my dream, one title, one title, one title for so long. And that part has helped me so much now because this is still carrying me now. And yeah. I'm still, I have that base happiness which is still in me with what I That's managed to achieve. Yeah. So a little bit of it is there. Do, do you think the disappointments <coughs> before were part of the level of happiness you've got from? from of course, the, everything perfect the way it happened. Because oh. it just, I could not have imagined a more perfect scenario. The disappointments before, the time it took, the opposition, yeah. the way it happened, everything just, it's like, it doesn't get better than that, for me personally, yeah? yeah. And therefore also to, to end it on a high like that, um, <coughs> sorry, was, uh, yeah, for me just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that gives me a lot for the rest of my life, actually. Yeah, no, I get that. And I'm, yeah. I'm pleased for you. I was there, by the way, we were talking, weren't we, before we came on set, that in the 2015, Bahrain Grand Prix. I was actually there with you and Lewis. Abu Dhabi and or Bahrain? Abu Dhabi, sorry. Dhabi, sorry. End of season, no? End of season, yeah, apologies. Yeah, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Um, so I was there when you experienced that disappointment. I was in the garage. I even went into the room with you and Lewis after a practice lap and watched as you interacted with your engineers and data analysts. So I knew how cross it. I know it's tough to lose, but it does give you so much more satisfaction when you get there. What was your take on our world then? You saw it so behind the scenes. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. <coughs> I was very impressed by, you know, I think in our world, there isn't enough scientific method. I think there's a lot of people who have a hunch and they defend their hunch but they don't test it properly. F1, of all the sports I have tried to deconstruct, is the one that tests its assumptions in the most systematic way. Uh, and of course, that applies across everything. I know that you are interested in the engineering side of F1, but when I spent the time with Paddy Lowe, who was your top engineer, and Toto Wolf, who I think is one of the equity holders in the F1 Big side boss. of the business, the boss. Um, and James Vowles, who was another of the key engineers. Do you remember him? Of course. Yeah, James. Um, you know, so on the pit stop, the, the number of <coughs> sensors so that they can test whether or not the wheel gun has gone in at the right angle. And if it hasn't, how it needs to Insane. be adjusted. You know, they had all of these different channels of data so that they could adapt 
what they were learning from each attempt to get the tyres onto the car. 16,000 channels of data from every time you drive around a track. When it came to the engine, they said, you know what, we didn't sort of blue sky what the engine should look like. We got a test engine into the cell early so that we could see what was working and what wasn't, and they adapted and iterated fast. Now, I think that's how great tech companies work. They get a minimum viable product into the market early, they see where the inevitable bugs and deficiencies are so that they can get into the iterative process. And I was really blown away. I spent a lot of time with your engineers by their level of intellectual honesty, their constant quest to find incremental improvements in every performance-related dimension. Um, I also thought they were very nice people. I thought they were a really good group and they made me feel very welcome. So I had a, a wonderful time. If, I'll throw in one criticism, if I may. Is that all right? Don't make it too big. Though, okay, right? not too big. Yeah, a keep little it, keep one. it mellow, yeah? Okay. I think there wasn't enough. You said you worked with a psychologist for a number of years. That's interesting. I think they could have done a little bit more. And this is often a problem in engineering. Because the data is hard data, it's numerical, quantitative data, it's quite easy to work with. Mm -hmm. It's quite scientific. Human beings are less easy to understand. There are emotions and all sorts of other things that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And I felt that the way they thought about interacting with their drivers wasn't as strong as it could have been. In other words, I don't think they were thinking enough about how they talk to you from the, you know, they were talking to you from the garage, right, when you're driving around. What kind of interventions got you in the right frame of mind? They were obviously providing information, and that's important, but also the rivalry between you and Lewis, how they handled that, how they made sure there wasn't too much friction. I thought that human side, when I talked to them about it, they, they hadn't given as much thought to that as to the technical and quantitative side. Now I am very, very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> That you managed to spot that in a couple of hours of being there. <laughs> I was at the weekend. Because was that the is weekend. one of the things that often annoyed me so much during my career. That's interesting. That the engineers forget that there's actually a human being right. in the car. Right, right, right. That's, that, so, that's it. That's but I don't want to, I mean, we had the most, I need to be careful, of course. Sure, we had sure. the most amazing yeah, engineers. Yeah. I'm so, so thankful. Yeah. And they did an awesome job. But sometimes there was this frustration that they forget there is a human being right. in the car. They think their numbers go all the way into the car yeah, yeah. and everything just continues uh, machine-wise. Right, and that's, that's what amazed me. Is that when they talked about you, it's like we've got these two kind of, it's like they talked about two AI algorithms that are in the car rather than two flesh and blood human beings with strong emotions. Um, and when I threw it in there, they would be like, hmm, hmm, that's interesting. But oh, it was yeah. outside their comfort zone. That's going to take time to get them right, to right, right. make progress on that. But I worked on that a lot with my engineer. I had the same engineer throughout my entire career of 11 wow. years, except for one year in, in Mercedes. So 10 of those years were the same engineer. Fascinating. From the very beginning all the way to winning that championship. The name? And Tony Ross. Uh -huh. Yeah, so thank you, Tony, for that. And great job he, he, he did and great relationship. And together we worked on that because... He also forgot that there's a human being who has emotions, who has yeah. fears. Yes. Yeah. But it's understandable also because we look a bit superhuman driving yeah, yeah, those yeah. crazy beast machines yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah. You, it just automatically puts us into yeah. a different place. It, it dehumanizes you. It it's dehumanizes. weird. I've got okay. to tell you, I, but I felt that. I found it almost impossible to talk to you guys. You'd get out of this machine and it felt like, you know, the Terminator had just got <laughs> out. And you'd be walking over and I'd be like, oh my goodness. And I think that is absolutely part of it. It turns you into a kind of a, an extension of the car. Um, and it dehumanizes you. In a weird kind of way, you're, it, it sort of superhumanizes you. It's true. And this impacts the engineers as well. And so I worked with Tony because very often throughout the race, when things would not be going so well, you would hear his disappointment <laughs> when he's communicating. <laughs> yeah, right. He gets more and more yeah. sad, yeah, more yeah, and yeah. more quiet, yeah. more and more dark. More and more can't be bothered anymore. <laughs> and so I and I you're in the car. And I'm in the car, yeah. supposed to be fully yeah. motivated driving yeah, 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 this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just yeah. pick yeah. His, his sound just makes me picture his utter disappointment yeah. in my performance out on the racetrack. Tell, yeah. gotta tell, it gotta just tell, pulls me right brilliant. further down. Gotta, the, 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 there was a table tennis <laughs> car, I mean it's a slightly different context, but there was a table tennis coach and I don't wanna say the name, but you'd miss and you don't wanna hit and, and I could hear this. <laughs> and I'd be That's like, enough. what? That's enough. That little sound is enough. Yeah, I was like, what? You know, don't get on my... I'm trying my hardest here. And it would, you know, really get me down. You'd, yeah, so that chemistry, I think, is, is re <laughs> really important. So we built it together, and then eventually he really 
he understood and he pushed himself to keep the voice up, keep fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it really worked. Which is what you need. And it really worked. And yeah. that gave me always a little bit of that extra motivation. Yes. Another one of those marginal gains to yeah. to the world championship because you always have setbacks. Even in a great race, you have setbacks. Yes. Yeah, things, even when you're leading, suddenly things don't feel so great. Lewis is catching again. Yes. It always happens. You have little setbacks. So, so important to That's keep up that uh, power. Because, um, you know, it struck me watching, I think it was sort of got the garage haven't you and then there's like a few meters and then there's somebody who is standing at from memory I mean, it's a long time it's a few years ago now it's some kind of a console and they'd be have the headphones on and they're talking to you right exactly so i, I but we had headphones on because we could hear them is that right yeah from, yeah so Only we could the hear. vvips get that opportunity oh wow though, i must huh? have been in the i must have been nice right to in that that one. <laughs> so i was listening to this thing and hang on a second you know what that doesn't sound right i mean yeah they've provided some information but they haven't done it in a way that i think is going to be absorbed effectively by this flesh and blood driver out there fighting for their lives um so it's really interesting to hear you c confirm that side of things it's something that i was pushing for in all the years right. and i was telling them you need to put this differently um, even when you're telling me strategy yeah. again they had their numbers yes. they assumed the the guy in the car knows everything <laughs> i'm not i don't have a clue what's yeah. going on out there right but they have everything the perfect overview with their screen yes. and so they assume that i must know everything and they forget sometimes yeah. actually i'm completely clueless out there <laughs> and i could do with a bit of information <laughs> and, but again i shouldn't i don't want to criticize too much because they're all absolutely awesome and the yeah, best yeah. in the world yeah, they yeah? Were, and, and, and so what lovely to, people um, exactly it must have been a joy to you know that that as an outsider at a sporting event of that significance okay they're quite relaxed because i think you were definitely one two already by that particular you're always one two yeah you're always one two you're always <laughs> right one from two. the start <laughs> um but they made an outsider feel very very welcome they were just very kind and warm and and i have such happy memories of it you know even that night i was exhausted i went i actually went back to the hotel and went to bed but there was some party that i think a celebration party and they you were can like, say the truth here and you I did, can, I know my wife said listen truth. I didn't go it's to the party right. can yeah. you believe it okay let's I didn't go to an cut, F1 but what an idiot cut. how did the truth I remember yeah, the seeing yeah, the you 6:30 in the morning the, yeah, yeah, the champagne. at breakfast yeah, yeah, yeah. on the table yeah with the crystal this is, how, yeah, this is my last memory <laughs> <laughs> it's not true it's not true <laughs> okay um let's move on we go to marginal gains let's touch on that a little bit yes. in in a little bit more detail yeah. one of your big mantras how uh, you're trying to teach people that the importance of focusing on every little incremental step to make the bigger picture yeah can you uh, maybe go into a little bit more depth in that yeah i think it is important i think it's definitely important this idea of breaking a problem into smaller parts and trying to find improvements at the smaller level and one of the reasons for that is your f1 engineers know only too well in a complex problem it's quite difficult to know which bits are implicated and what's successful and which bits are not but if you break it down you can isolate what they would probably call the causal variables and therefore make more progress but you know that is a technical way of explaining it um, it became very famous in cycling where a, a coach uh, <coughs> Dave Brailsford said you know instead of talking hot air we need to look at improving the aerodynamic efficiency of the bike, the diet, antibacterial hand gel. They take mattresses from stage to stage at the Tour de France so you get better sleep quality um, and a whole range of other things. That attention to detail to improve. And I think you can probably apply that to one's life. How can I get better at my job? Well, maybe I need to get more sleep or I need to improve my meetings or if I'm working in a bidding process, I need to improve my client relationships. I'll give you one example from business. You know, Google, big, I know you've done a business pod, but this is probably a good way to, to talk about it. Google, big equity value, very smart people. But they said, you know, can we improve the color of our web links on the Google toolbar? It's a blue color. So they divided the color blue into 40 different shades randomly allocated users who clicked onto the website to each of the different shades, measured the resulting profitability of the relationships, established that one of the shades was more profitable than the other 39, so changed all of their web links to that shade of blue and it boosted annual revenue by $200 million. And they do about 
you know, 12,000 of these A-B tests every year because, you know, they don't see their current product as the end of the story. They want to see how they can improve every single bit of it. And I think you apply that to big problems, you can often get great solutions. Um, I'm going to catch on to two stories Go because on. of what you said. First of all, I have an ice cream business. Uh -huh. And I decided to, to call the medium cup. Instead of calling it medium, I now call it normal. Yes. So you have small, normal, large. Yeah. And that tiny change made more people naturally want the normal cup. That's interesting. That usually took the small cup. <laughs> right. And, and, so, and it has a massive impact on the business. So, so that is a positive impact because they're going from small to medium. Exactly. And your margin on the medium is higher than your margin small. Of course. Yeah, that's perfect. Just ne changing the name eh, from yes. medium to the normal one. Yeah. And another one because you talked about cycling. Um, so in my championship year 2016, I was at the minimum weight. We had to be diet, yeah? Because in the beginning of the season, we were told one kilo of body weight, because we were on top of the minimum weight, one kilo body weight, 300th of a second per lap lost. Yeah, one, kilo, one kilo, three hundred. Which that's is in lot. our world, yeah. two kilos, three kilos, you get to a tenth. Yeah. It is massive. That's yeah? massive. So you can understand we were absolutely at our minimum. Yes. Then I get to the summer break and I'm like, I need to try and lose a little bit more because I'm still above the limits. I can't go on diet. It's going to destroy me mentally. I can't do that in the middle of the season because you need to play the long game and, and have strength towards the end. What am I going to do? Okay, I'm, I'm cycling, I have these heavy leg muscles. I stopped cycling, because the uh, summer break is four weeks. So I stopped cycling, and I just did walking up the treadmill uh, in a yeah, steep yeah, incline, yeah, yeah. and I lost the kilo in the four weeks. Brilliant. After the summer break, <coughs> I was on pole in Suzuka from Lewis by two hundredths of a second. Wow. And the kilo from the n not bicycling anymore yes. was three hundredths. That's brilliant. That and is that a got brilliant, me, brilliant story. That got me the race win in Suzuka and really unsettled Lewis mentally. Yes. And that put me ahead in the championship by a big, big margin. And that then got me the championship in the end. <laughs> and so this is to your marginal oh, it's, gains. It's super. An example. It's, 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 it's brilliant. And it makes me realize how in F1, the margins are so tiny. The margins are so small. And there's so many different things that impact performance, your weight how you interact with your engineer on the communication, yeah. aerodynamism, the engine. It's, um, you know, if you don't apply that mindset, you're never gonna win an F1, no chance. All it takes is one competitor to find one small advantage by having that attention to detail and you're screwed. Yeah, it's true. Which takes us nicely to the next point. You believe that putting in the workload, you can outperform talent. Who doesn't put so much workload? Um, well, I'd, I'd probably, it's a bit more nuanced than that. I, th I think really my point is that success goes to what we said right at the beginning is a journey. It is a journey. And if, for example, I was seeing situations where you'd have a young footballer who would be invited into the Arsenal or the United Academy and think, wow. I'm in the United Academy, I must be a genius. And they've got agents telling them how wonderful they are, they're getting money for the first time, and they just think that their transition into the Premier League is certain, because they're that talented. What happens, they stop putting in the hard graft on the training pitch, and they don't transition into first team football. I think it's dangerous if you think talent is enough. Okay. It isn't enough. My argument, it's twofold really, one, we overestimate the significance of talent in the construction of success in most areas of human activity. And that this has downstream consequences, one, for people who think they're super talented and therefore don't put in the hard work. But I think it has another implication that's very important for young people, which is, imagine you're in a maths classroom and you know, you're given a particular problem by the teacher and you're you know, struggling with it, it's algebra. And there's somebody on the next table who's doing it really, really well. And you go, oh my goodness, they're talented. I don't have any talent. I don't have a brain. I don't have a, that's my mobile phone just falling out of my pocket. I don't have a brain for mathematics. Therefore, I'm going to give up. Do you see what I mean? If you think that it's about talent, and because you're struggling at one particular point in your life, you assume or infer that you lack talent, it makes sense to give up. So resilience is destroyed by too big a belief in talent. So I want young people and older people to recognize that, yes, talent matters, for sure. It's not insignificant. But how, what we do with our talents is more important. 
Okay, I had planned to go against you on this point, but I actually agree now. But go on, disagree, the disagree. You, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't. The way you put it makes absolute sense. Thank you. And I always believe also hard work beats talent, which is uh, in a nutshell, I guess. It, 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 yeah, it, exactly. And, you know, ju- just to, you know, I see it with my kids. I know you've got two daughters, one and three. I've got a son at four and a, and a daughter at six. And it is so easy for young people to give up quickly because of their self-limiting beliefs. I think the other problem that I see, particularly for young people, and I think parents will relate to this, is you look at the world that young people are increasingly inhabiting. It's a social media world, it's an online world, where people airbrush their photos to make them look perfect, and they curate their lives to look perfect. I think young people looking at these images of perfection think that life is about looking and acting perfect. But then, why would you ever put your hand up in class if you don't know something? You don't want to look less than perfect, but if you don't put your hand up, you don't find out what you didn't know. You know, you don't want to take risks because you might be less good than you hoped, but that's how we grow. We must have in our, in our young people a tolerance of the failures that are a part of life and learning. And I think that is very important. It goes directly back to what I meant about success being a journey. Because when you see success as a journey, you see taking risks as part of the journey. You see errors as part of the journey. You don't see them shaming or stigmatizing. And I think you get, you know, you get young people into that frame of mind. It doesn't mean they win the F1 World Championship. It doesn't mean they win a Nobel Prize, but it means they grow as people rather than jeopardizing that growth because of their self-limitations. Such a problem that in schools, you don't have any of that N- schools don't show that to kids what you just now said okay i think I, well i don't yeah that i i think i think some schools do yeah i think some head teachers and teachers are really beginning to take this agenda that school isn't just about learning facts yeah. you know it's not just about learning chemical formulae and then regurgitating them in an essay or in an exam it's about these softer skills okay. because the future of our world it's not going to be just about how much we know because knowledge is changing so fast with artificial intelligence and quantum computing. You know, it's about finding out what we don't know. And these are human skills. These are softer skills, are psychological skills. I agree with you, we need more of that in schools. For sure, we need more of it in schools. And that's, you know, that's why you know, I've got these two You Are Awesome books that I've written for kids for your two daughters when they get older. But I would like to see a much bigger emphasis in education on, on, on these issues. I would like to go a little bit deeper into that then because I find that so cool how you're now trying to take your, your messages for adults and, and changing it in a way that it's understandable for much younger kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm very thankful that you brought two books along <laughs> for my daughters. Pleasure. I'm going to make sure that they do read that. And I hope to really engage them in this kind of path as soon as possible. I'm so strongly believe in this because yeah. uh, I've seen it on myself as well. This the value of this journey that we're yeah. all that we're talking about. Can you talk us through a little bit the the book and maybe an essence of it or? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I can. Um, so after writing Bouts and Blackbox Thinking, I, a load of parents were saying, yeah, this has been really helpful, but my kids need to hear these messages. You know, we want our children to be aware of all of this stuff. And I was like, no, but I can't do that. I'm not a um, children's author. And then I thought, hang on, I'm limiting myself. You know, I'm not talented at children. You know, that's not my thing. And I thought maybe I can, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could. Run. So I started reading children's books, seeing the kind of phrases that are used. I looked at which books are successful and which are not successful. I tried different types of chapter on different young people to see what they engaged with and what they related to. So it was a massive journey for me to figure, and it was a hugely daunting thing to do because I thought, you know what, if this bombs, what will people say, public (laughs) perception? But I thought, sod it, I'm gonna give this a go and I'm so glad I did because you know the handwritten letters from young people, and, oh, and, and oh, it, it's it's. I'm just so so pleased I did it, um, and that that's a, that's a basic message is is we need young people with that <coughs> mindset that I'm going to take a risk, I'm going to grow, and I'm going to see these failures not as indictments of who I am, but as great rich learning opportunities. Where can we find the book? Amazon? Oh, so yeah, yeah, Amazon. Yeah, All around bookshops. The world. Yeah, yeah. You are awesome. You are awesome. So go on t- can I ask you a quick question on, on parents? So I'm, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to pretend I'm an expert on this at all. You know, it's tough, right? Parenting is so miles, more, miles more difficult than you're expecting. But you, what was your upbringing like? Because your father was a world champion. So expect, I think he won a Grand Prix like within four days of you being born. 
I mean, people probably asked you a million times, was there pressure? What was it like? How, how was your upbringing compared to how you sort of think of an ordinary upbringing? Uh, quite simple, really. Um, my mom, just unconditional love. Yeah. And my father, he had this, uh, gave me this expectation yes, yeah, that he expected from me as well to achieve, to drive, to work hard, yes. uh, to push. And, and this was... So that's sometimes not so easy then, yeah? yeah? Because, of course, the most important thing for me was to make my parents proud, yes. to get the recognition, yeah? And then to see, uh, and it wasn't so easy to, to make my, I mean, subjectively feeling. Uh, mm. He would probably say, I was always proud of you at all yes. times yes. of the day. But subjectively, it wasn't yeah. so easy yeah. to get yeah. The, yeah. the proudness, yeah? Right. And that was then always something, but in hindsight, an awesome driving force for me. Yes. Yeah? Because that's one of the ingredients why... I wanted to achieve myself yes and have success myself and don't sit on on the wealth that my my parents had accumulated yeah right. in fact i never wanted to have anything to do with it i yes. always wanted to make my own way make my own money yes. never wanted to spend my parents money i was super conservative always. wow that's interesting and, and so that was that's really cool how they've managed to a lot is gete genetics also it's yeah, a combination yeah, 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 yeah. but they yeah. managed to instill um this driving force with me and, and that's uh, and that, that's what you know you say your dad you know maybe obviously an amazing dad and and he and he pushed you in the right way the thing i find really difficult is it's easy to state you should push but without being pushy but isn't it difficult to get that balance of course it's massively difficult i can already see it with myself with my three-year-old daughter <coughs> yeah yeah just pushing her to walk Come one on. week earlier and or <coughs> pushing her to learn the right. alphabet one week earlier <laughs> Yeah, because I want I want her to impress yeah. as well and and whatever and that really really sucks. Yeah. Um, but okay. yeah, I guess. But I'm aware of it because of all the studies I've done, and that helps me be careful. Did you read um, a lot before becoming a dad? Because I, I, awesome. I read a lot. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I read a lot, and but even th just the philosophy that I studied for myself helps me being a dad because I understand. I understand much better why I I, I know why I'm pushing her. Yeah. Yeah, because I want to impress other parents with my daughter, yeah, which right. is just nuts. <coughs> That's a massive issue in, it's in, nuts, in the UK. But that is the reason why I'm pushing her. I yeah. want to impress other people with my daughter. Yeah. I want a, my daughter to be the fastest, the greatest, the smartest, the, and it's just crazy, yeah. stupid. And so, I, I mean, it's worth saying a couple of things on this. <coughs> You'll have read some of this too. I mean, my take on it is that for a young person to really reach a high level at something, they have to internalize the motivation. If they're just doing it to please a parent or a coach or an adult, it's too big a internal contradiction. Do you know what I mean? It, it, they burn out because they're not doing it for the right reasons. And after they get to the certain level in some sport or play music, when you interview them later in life, they're often a bit resentful towards their parent. Why did you keep taking me to the violin? I didn't even want to do it. Whereas if a child internalizes the motivation, so they want to do the sport or the activity for its own sake, they don't burn out. And later in life, they're often very grateful to the parent for taking them to the thing they wanted to go to. And I think that's one of the things that a great coach or parent does is they somehow facilitate the young person finding their true passion. That's my dad. That's how he does. That's that's how he managed to find that balance, I guess. Yeah. So that was uh, that was very very helpful. So I'm very very thankful. Mm. Awesome uh, awesome preparation for life. Maybe let's end it <coughs> end it on that really nice yeah, note. Yeah, it's, it's dry it's and dry in here, right? <laughs> 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 but, uh, <coughs> by the way, thank you for having awesome. me on. This no. can I just say, you're a good interviewer. I don't get interviewed very often because I'm, I'm a I'm normally and I don't interview very but often. But you're good. You're good, and it's a journey, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. I'm going to see you on what's the biggest German TV channel? DSL. <laughs> I'm coming to it? the UK. You coming? You going to live in yeah. the UK? No, no. But I'm going on TV with you. Let's do it. Right? Where are we going? Rosberg side. BBC One. Ten thirty at night. The high performance revolution. Saturdays. This is it. This is going to go absolutely through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure. And for me, really uh, uh, very, very nice to dive into these topics, which I've never done before in such depth. And I have so much, I've spent so much time on these. So it's really, it's really nice. Uh, I hope uh, you, dear listener, also appreciate it. 
and were able to follow <laughs> our deep dive <laughs> into so and I hope it wasn't too much. But um, no, thanks. It's been awesome. Please remember to subscribe as well for my podcast. And your podcast is called? Uh, Flint Off Savage and the Ping Pong Guy. Right. A little bit more. <laughs> yeah, a bit longer. <laughs> a bit longer than my <laughs> Beyond Victory name. But please subscribe for my one. It's on all channels or I'm not going to be able to repeat. But please subscribe for Matt Matthew's <laughs> podcast as well, I guess, on all channels too. Uh, that's it. We're here at uh, CAA offices in the over the top of London. So Beautiful. thanks to CAA as well for letting us use these offices. It was really cool. Tune in for the next one. Bye bye, everybody. See you around. Bye bye.